Okay, welcome to another video. I've been getting a ton of value out of this uh, book, um, Amazon Kindle book. Um, com kind of been having a bit of a debate as to is is a Kindle book worth it, worth the sacrifices of not being able to copy paste, uh, share it in certain ways, only being able to access it behind a uh, login wall, um, that sort of thing. But um, this book is is turning out to definitely. Um, be like like reading this book in any manner is is pretty awesome. This is a great book. So let's continue working on this. So what is it? Uh, oh, it's not a it's not a Kindle. It's a cloud. Oh, it is a Kindle. It's a Kindle cloud reader. That should just bookmark it or something. But in the last video, we worked on. Uh, accepting input from a user um, through the command line interface. Um, one of the things this book advocates for is building uh, robust uh, uh, programs that can be run by a user just on the command line interface. Um, they think that's uh, a better way to do things than building like a web app or something like that. And I've been thinking about that. Um, a l well, actually, I haven't been really thinking about that that much. But when I first read that, I wasn't sure if I agreed with that because um, I just thought like maybe a web app would be more um, would be better um, but um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if I agree with that now uh, having learned about uh, click um, because it, it just seems really easy to uh, build that uh, UI um, and then you know, a matter of using the UI, it, 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 it's easy to use a, a UI like that as well. So you don't get, you know, fancy uh, web app, but you save yourself some headaches um, and you get just as much, if, if not a better uh, user experience that you can deliver. So I think I'm on board with that concept now. Uh, forget about web UIs, forget about uh, graphic UIs at, at all. Um, just focus on making uh, command line uh, UIs. So to do that, we learned about four things. We learned about just the arg parse. We learned about uh, argv, system argv. We learned about click. We learned about fire. We got through everything. We got through all the exercises, but unfortunately, the third arc exercise, using fire to access methods in an existing Python script from the command line, um, that I could not get to work, and I even googled online for like a, a more simple example of that and i couldn't get that to work either so we're just going to move on from that the the book recommends using click in most cases anyway and click i did get to work without any issues so my big takeaway from chapter three is just to use click uh for command line uh interfaces so that's what i'm, I'm probably going to plan to do uh if i if i take and run with this in other contexts all right, so now we're moving on to chapter four. This is useful Linux utilities. The command line and its tooling were one of the main reasons Alfredo felt attached to Linux servers when he started his career. One of his first jobs as a system administrator in a medium-sized company involved taking care of everything that was Linux related. The small IT department was focused on the Windows servers and desktops and they thoroughly disliked using the command line. At one point, the IT manager told him that he understood graphical user interfaces, GUIs, installing utilities, and tooling in general to solve problems. I am not a coder. If it doesn't exist as a GUI, I can't use it, he said. And this is where, you know, my, I, I, I thought, I, I'm wondering where they're going with this, because this is kind of where my thinking is, not that, you know, I'm a trained network engineer, so, you know, I, I live on a command line, um, but um, if I were to develop something for someone else to use, uh, my mind would go towards a you know, web app to build some kind of graphical user interface. So I'm wondering if they can, uh, uh, if this IT manager was, like where they're going with this is, is they were able to win over the 
IT manager with some uh, command line user interface. Alfredo was hired as a contractor to help out with the few Linux servers that the company had. At this time, Subversion SVN was all the rage for version control, now it's Git. And the developers depended on this single SVN server to push their work. Instead of using the centralized identity server provided by two domain controllers, it used a text-based authentication system that mapped a user to a hash representing the password. This meant that usernames didn't necessarily map to those in the domain controller and that passwords could be anything. Often a developer would ask to reset the password and someone had to edit this file with the hash. Oh, edit this text file with the hash. A project manager asked Alfredo to integrate the SVN authentication with the domain controller, Microsoft's Active Directory. The first question he asked was why hadn't the IT department done this already? They say it is not possible, but Alfredo, this is a lie. SVN can integrate with Active Directory. He had never used an authentication service like Active Directory and barely understood SVN, but he was determined to make this work. And this is something um, I think is common in, in the IT field. You're, you're tasked to do something that may or may not be possible. So a lot of, a lot of it is about either determination, just seeing it through until you find a way and you make it work, or having that you know, professional communication to outline why it doesn't work and, and be able to communicate that properly. Alfredo set out to read all about SVN and Active Directory, tinkered his way around a virtual machine with an SVN server running, and tried to get this authentication to work. It took about two weeks to read up on all the pieces involved and to get it to work. He succeeded in the end and was able to get this system into production. This felt incredibly powerful. He had acquired unique knowledge and was now ready to be fully in charge of this system. The IT manager, as well as the rest of the department, were ecstatic. Alfredo tried to share this newly acquired knowledge with others and was always met with an excuse. No time, too busy, other priorities, and perhaps some other time, maybe next week. An apt description for technologists is knowledge workers. Your curiosity and a never-ending pursuit of knowledge will continue to make you and the environments you work on much better. Don't ever let a coworker or a whole IT department, as in Alfredo's case, be a deterrent for improving systems. If there is an opportunity to learn something new, jump on it. The worst that can happen is that you have acquired knowledge that perhaps won't be used often, but on the other hand, might change your professional career. Linux does have desktop environments, but its real power comes from understanding and using the command line, and ultimately by extending it. When there are no pre-made tools to solve a problem, seasoned DevOps people will craft their own. This notion of being able to come up with solutions by putting together the core pieces is incredibly powerful and is what ultimately happened at that job where it felt productive to complete tasks without having to install off-the-shelf software to fix things. This chapter will go through some common patterns in the shell and will include some useful Python commands that should enhance the ability to interact with the machine. We find that creating aliases and one-liners is the most fun one can have at work and sometimes they are so useful that they end up as plugins or standalone pieces of software. So one thing I wanted to say about, about this um, section uh, specifically um, 
this don't ever let a coworker or a whole IT department be a deterrent for improving systems. Uh, in my experience, um, this this is hard because you're going to have, you know, objectives and measures and all those sorts of things. And uh, I have seen um, it be the case where whoever is not following those those and like you know is not doing what they're expected to do um, gets ahead because they're using their time for things that are going to improve things um, instead of just what um, you know the department thinks is what they need and you know going day to day month to month year to year with you know these suboptimal systems that have obvious improvements on them so I would say um, like it, it's hard because you know you you want to make a, a good impression you want to do a good job at your work and, and you know the best way to do that is to you know check the boxes you know get get pick up a ticket do it well and, and do it to everyone's satisfaction so if you go off the rails and, and you're just off in the clouds your boss doesn't even hear from you for you know days or weeks or months until you come back and say oh look at this and <laughs> change everything for the better and be, you know you know at that point are, are hailed as a, a a magic man I, I, you know that that's um, it, it's hard to um, it's hard to um, let's see here so Yeah, I find like it's hard to kind of balance day-to-day uh, -day expectations with uh, a never-ending pursuit of knowledge. Um, so I don't really have good advice for that. Um, I have seen situations where, um, Yeah, I, I, I really I really wish I had better advice for that. Um, it, in my own case, if what I think what I would do is um, because there there's there's the idea of you you just veer off the wheels, you you basically disappear into the woods, um, you know, metaphorically, and you spend days, you know, weeks just, just learning something, getting to to the bottom of something and really figuring out how to do it well. And then you realize that you, you can't use it at all. You know, that's that's a big that's a something you probably don't want to do very often on, on the job. Um, and then of course there's there's the best case scenario. Your your curiosity gets the best of you, you you know, you pour into something, you, you go off the rails, you don't complete any tickets, you barely even speak to everyone anyone, you you completely disappear and then you come back and you you've solved everything and you and you're like a magic man like you know I've, I've seen people do basically that um, just completely go in a different direction than anyone even knew to explore and then come out a, a complete hero for for building you know something that is just so much better than anything there there was um, but you know, in order for that to work, you've got to be, you've got to, you, you have to actually, you know, connect on that and that that's not guaranteed and stuff. So this is something I kind of think about a lot is like, how do you balance um, being seen as like a dependable, reliable, uh, go-to employee with, you know, a, a um, kind of a can-do attitude, willing to take up, like, like for this, like, I guess, like, oh, well, see, it's, it's a little bit different, too, because I think this book is kind of misrepresenting um, a lot about how, you know, that kind of curiosity works in a lot of environments. Um, just the fact that the author, and, and I'm sorry, and I, I, I lost my place in the book, and it's for some reason it's not uh, loading. Um, this is another huge negative with Kindle books having to 
have it load like that, but um, it looks like he was kind of in a um, special circumstance um, where basically they knew exactly what they wanted him to do and they tasked him with doing it. I, I typically don't, I, I think that that is not a typical thing that, that you'll find yourself in. Uh, more commonly you'll say, they, they won't say, um, so here, here's what happened to, to Alfredo. Um, a project manager asked Alfredo to integrate the SVN authentication with the domain controller. So a project manager somehow knew that the SVN authentication could be integrated with the domain controller despite the fact that somebody told him it, it was not possible. He knew that like there was a lie or, or something like that. That I think is a very rare situation. I think a more common scenario would be, you, you know, you're tasked, you're judged, you're assessed on uh, this sort of framework use, using a centralized identity server. Um, oh wait, no, instead of using a centralized identity server, um, you know, using a text-based authentication system mapped a user to a hash representing the password. Um, yeah, so often a developer would reset the password and someone had to edit this text file. So I think norm, a normal situation you would, you would find yourself in is not a project manager, you know, like changing your life by giving you this interesting project. I think what you'll, you'll find yourself in is an environment where like you're given a ticket to uh, change uh, these passwords. So yeah, so a developer would ask to reset the password and someone had to edit this text file with the hash. So you'd get a ticket saying to edit this text file with the hash and then you just keep getting these tickets. and you would never hear from a project manager, from other developers, from a, 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 a especially, especially a manager, you would never hear, you know, hey, do this because we know this works. We just, and somebody looked into it, but, but we know that it's not, you know, you would never ever hear that, I think. Um, what, what you need to be able to do, my, my advice to anyone watching this is, when you get in a ticket like that, um, kind of be skeptical about what you're being asked to do. Uh, or not, not about what you're being asked to do, but about the value of what you're being asked to do. Because, you know, if you get a ticket, you're gonna get um, kind of um, like, you, you know, work counted in your favor or whatever for, for doing this. Um, you need to be able to say, okay, yeah, I can, I can edit this text file with the hash. I can, I can, you know, make this developer's day. I can, I can kind of come to the rescue now. But is that actually going to like fix anything? Is that going to, is that the answer to this problem, or is that just a, a symptom? Like, can I, can I do a root cause? And and you have to be the one to. Um, to ask if the SVN authentication with the domain controller is possible. The project manager isn't gonna ask you to do that, especially if it's already been looked into and, and told that it wasn't able to happen. They're not gonna know it was a lie. So I think this book kind of misrepresents that a bit um, and kind of assumes you'll be in a kind of a unicorn environment that, that Alfredo seems to be in where his uh, project manager somehow magically knows all the answers and gives him this project that he can, you know, just disappear into books in a few weeks and, and come out, you know, with, with this perfect solution. Like, I think more commonly, um, you'll be doing something and you'll think to yourself, why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. There, there's no reason to do it this way. And then you'll have to build a case to the manager. You'll have to be the one going to your manager saying, hey, you know what, instead of doing this, what I could do is integrate the SVN authentication with the domain controller. And then most cases, I think, you know, your manager will say, oh, great, that's wonderful. Can you look into this and figure it out? 
um, or like make a ticket to, to schedule some time to, to figure this out. And, um, you know, most managers will do that, but to be honest, I think uh, you probably will, might end up in a situation where, you know, managers say, oh, well, we don't have time for you to focus on that, or you need to just, uh, you know, edit the text file and move on because we don't have time for that, we don't have the resources for that. And, um, you know, I think, I think that kind of situation might exist. Um, and I wish this book would talk about that. Um, I haven't really experienced anything like that, uh, at least not like really bad. Um, so I, I don't really know what to say to that, but um, I guess I guess I'd like to finish up this rant and just say that this scenario of a project manager asking you to do something that they know can be done, uh, I think is is really rare. Um, and I think more commonly what you'll see is work coming in and requested of you that you know can be done in a better way. Um, so you have to you have to demonstrate that somehow. You have to either come up with a prototype and do a demo that, that shows the better way uh, or you need to be able to communicate it. So, so the onus is on you. Um, I, I really don't think uh, this scenario where, where a project manager will ask you to do something specific, especially if somebody already tried it and told the project manager that it's not possible. I really don't think that would ever happen. Like this is, this is just completely made up. So unfortunately, I, I wish I had better advice to give uh, in this situation. I guess, I guess my, my advice is just, you know, professionalism, professional communication, you, you know, Build a PowerPoint. Like, like if you see something coming in, you know this is ridiculous. Open a PowerPoint, and the first thing you do, you just build a PowerPoint presentation with you know ten slides or whatever, and then you say to your to your project manager because they're not going to be communicating that way. Hey, can I give a half an hour hour demonstration on this problem I see and and um, uh, dive into it deeper and see you know have some questions in there too like. To, to ask so yeah so I guess that would be my advice is is um, build a like an actual demo prototype PowerPoint presentation about how you can improve uh, a process um, I mean I to be honest like the best way to do it is not to do that is to just improve the process and then show how you improve the process um, but what I'm talking about is a situation where you will need days, weeks, months to dive in and investigate something. Because what uh, Alfredo got here is, is um, so let's see here. So he got two weeks to read up on all the pieces involved and to get it to work. And the reason he got that is because he was given it as an assignment. So in the real world, I don't think you're just going to be given two weeks to look into something deeply. Um, you're kind of going to have to fight for that two weeks. And you can do that with uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Ideally, you know, you're doing some kind of self-learning like I'm doing now. And you can just, you know, in two hours say, hey, like, you know, let's... Uh, like, look, look at what I did. Look, look at this example of, of what I did and how it'll help. But um, sometimes you might not know uh, the way to solve a problem. So just kind of fighting for those two weeks to look into it deeper is, is something I think uh, people need to be prepared to do who are working professionally in IT. Um, just kind of sitting around and waiting for someone to, a project manager to give you the perfect project, um, I just don't think is, is practical. All right, so next section is disk utilities. There are several different utilities that you can use to get information about devices in a system. A lot of them have feature overlap and some have an interactive session to deal with disk operations, such as FDisk and Parted. It is crucial to have a good grasp on disk utilities, not only to retrieve information and manipulate partitions, 
but also to accurately measure performance. Performance, in particular, is one of the tough things to accomplish correctly. The best answer to the question, how do I measure the performance of a device, is it depends. Because it is difficult to do for the specific metric one is looking for. Um, you know what, I think I might highlight that because I do want to be able to measure performance. So, but at the same time, I'm just, I'm not sure. I'm going to highlight this though. Okay. All right. Next step is, or next part is measuring performance. If we had to work in an isolated environment with a server that doesn't have access to the internet or that we don't control and therefore can't install packages, we would have to say that the DD tool, which should be readily available on all major Linux distributions, would help provide some answers. So, uh, okay, I'll finish reading this. If at all possible, pair it with the IOSTAT to isolate the command that hammers the device versus the one that gets the report. So I'm gonna bring up my GNS3 lab here. Perfect. Oh, this lab is so nice now that I switched over to Linux. But I'm gonna spin up a, a virtual machine on here to do some of these Linux commands on. So I'm just opening up the same lab that I've been using for this. Um, hopefully it won't take too long to boot up here. Oop. I can't believe my Roomba still has battery. It's been unplugged for, for days. So I'm trying to fix the wheel on it. All right, so I'll use this for my command line to run the uh, commands given in the book. Might take a little bit of time. There we go. Okay. All right, so the first command um, that was introduced here was the command dd. So we'll try that once we get a command line. Still don't have one. I might pause it. I might need a, a break here, um, and I'll, I'll come back shortly. Oh, you know what? I'm going to come back shortly anyway. I need a, a break, so I'll be back soon. All right, I'm back, and I've got my uh, command line. So um, let's let's try this ddd command, or sorry, dd command. Okay, so it looks like it's just hanging. It's it's not doing anything. Um, Maybe it'll it'll let us know how to use it later. Um, yeah, we'll do a info on it or a help on it. Okay, so we can get help on it. Uh, yeah, so couple file converting and formatting according to the upper ends. So hopefully we'll get a lesson on that later. Let's check out the other command. Oh, so that one I don't have, so um, maybe I can do a app git install iostat uh, or app with a or is it just apt install? Uh, can I So I, have, I do have internet. Okay, let's just keep on going. Hopefully they'll walk us through it. As a seasoned performance engineer uh, once said, it depends on what is measured and how. For example, DD is a single is single threaded and has its limitations, um, such as being unable to do multiple random reads and writes. It also measures throughput and not input slash output operations per second, IOPS. What are you measuring, throughput or IOPS? Caution, a word of warning on these examples. They can destroy your system. 
don't follow them blindly and make sure to use devices that can get erased. So I'm using a VM, won't be a problem for me. This simple one-liner will run to get some numbers of a brand new device in this case. Okay, so I, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Is that something plugged into there or? Let's just try it. Let's just try doing exactly what they have listed here. So DD IF. Okay, and this is gonna not gonna work because I don't have the same devices plugged in. Oh, it seemed to have worked. It writes 10 records of 100 megabytes at a rate of one gigabit. Oh, sorry, one gigabyte, because uh, there's capital B per second. This is throughput. An easy way to get IOPS with DD is to use IOSTAT. In this example, IOSTAT runs only on the device getting hammered with DD with the dash D flag only to give the device information and with an interval of one second. So I don't have IOSTAT. Um, okay, so I think if I update my app kit, I might be able to download it because it's, it's really far behind. <laughs> okay, so apt get install. That's, uh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, so now I have it. Oh, no, never mind. It was unable to locate it. Um, can I do a search? Uh, app search. Oh, uh, what is it? It's like apt cache search item stack. Oh. Okay, well, let's go to the internet. So we're going to say item stack. Okay, so here we go. How to all install and use IOSTAT. So we're not running this version of Ubuntu, we're running the next one, but uh, I'm hoping we can install it the same way. Okay, and we won't need the sudo because I'm, I'm logged in as root already. That was easy. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, follow along uh, with the next example here. Okay, and now this is the, I believe, the file we just created. Okay, I'm not getting any results here. I'm not sure what's going on. The IOSTAT output will repeat itself for every second until a control C is issued to cancel the operation. The second column in the output is TPS, which stands for transactions per second and is the same as IOPS. A nicer way to visualize the output, and I'll stop it here, which avoids the clutter that a repeating command produces is to clear the terminal on each run. Okay, so let's try that. While true, do clear, and iostats-g, so this part looks familiar. Dev 
SDC. And uh, sleep one. Done. Okay, so now we only see it uh, one time and it just clears the screen and reprints every second instead of flooding the, the buffer. Okay, so we can automate tests with FIO. If DD and IOSTAT aren't sufficient, the most commonly used tool for performance testing is FIO. Uh, okay, so let's see if I've got FIO. And I don't, so let's go ahead and download that. That's downloading, I'll keep reading. It can help clarify the performance behavior of a device in a read heavy or write heavy environment and even adjust the percentages of read versus writes. The output from FIO is quite verbose. verbose. The example below trims it to emphasize the IOPS found on both read and write operations. Okay, so we'll follow along. Now that we've got FIO, we can see it runs. Let's clear this out and run it. Name, DC, performance, file, name equals the STC, file engine equals Okay, I think this was it. Oh, no, it failed parsing. So it failed parsing on RAND. Oh, yeah, I, I did that wrong. So it's got to be RAND RW. Okay, this, oh, so it was unable to open IO depth equals one. So. Okay, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe the backslash needed to be here, or maybe, maybe you know what, I don't think I need a backslash, because I think the reason they have that is because they put it on another line. Okay, so this, yeah, okay, this is what we're, we're looking for here. Yeah, so we've got, SC, yep, perfect. This, unfortunately, because it's a Kindle book, we don't see the output uh, the, way, the way we'd like to, but uh, let's continue on. The flags used in the example, name the job SDC performance. So that's the name of the job. It's named SDC performance. Point to the slash dev slash SDC device directly. Will require super user permissions. Um, use the native syntax asynchronous IO library Set the I.O. depth to one, number of sequential I.O. requests to be sent at a time, and define random read and write operations of 32 kilobytes for the buffer size using buffered I.O. can be set to one to use unbuffered I.O. on a 64 megabyte file. Quite the lengthy command here. The F.I.O. tool has a tremendous number of additional options that can help with most any case where accurate IOPS measurements are needed. For example, it can span the test across many devices at once, do some IO warm-up, and even set IO thresholds for the test if a defined limit shouldn't be surpassed. Finally, the many options in the command line can be configured with 
INI style files so that the execution of jobs can be scripted nicely. All right, so that didn't ring any bells to me. Uh, I haven't really done anything like this before. Um, so it might just go all over my head. Um, I hope I hope there's not a lot in this book that does that because I, I thought this book was going to ring a lot of bells, but um, it's just a, hopefully this will lead to something larger. Next part is partitions. We tend to default to FDisk with its interactive session to create partitions. Let's try that. FDisk, bad usage. But in some cases, FDisk doesn't work well, such as with large partitions, two terabytes or larger. In those cases, your fallback should be used parted. Oh, in those cases, your fallback should be to use parted. So let's see if I've got that. Oh, I don't have it. So let's see if I can do a uh, apt get install parted dash y. Okay, now I've got it. A quick interactive session shows how to create a primary partition with fdisk with the default start value and four uh, gigabytes of size. At the end, the W key is sent to write changes. So my understanding of gigabytes are, are basically they're like gigabytes, but um, they're gigabytes that um, uh, fall upon a like an octet boundary. So it's like if you say you have one. Um, you know what? Let's let's just quick Google what what that is. So just so my understanding is is really nice and clear. Yeah, it's a it's a unit of measure of capacity, just like a gigabyte or a gigabit. So a gigabit would would measure uh, how many bits of data. A gigabyte is how many bytes of data, but a gigabyte is how many bytes of data based on the powers of two. So if you had a gigabyte, if you had two gigabytes, then you would have uh, 2,000 uh, bits. But if you had two gigabytes, then you would have um, uh, uh, Yeah, you would have you would have about the same number, but you would have two to the. Yeah, because here it's ten, to the, but here it's. So. Uh, yeah, so you would have you would have uh, two of these. This times two is how many gigabytes you would have. Yeah, so one, one, uh, yeah, it's 1024. I forget exactly why it's like that. I think it, it has something to do with like the bits, but it has something to do with like it being a number that makes sense to like in terms of binary, I think. Like it's like a base two number. But we could just we could just move on. We don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Um, okay, so let's uh, try this. Oh, we don't need to sue you. Okay, so changes will remain in memory only until you decide to write them. Uh, we cannot uh, open. Uh, SDS. I wonder, is that is that what they meant to do? Is, is they meant to do SDC? But um, that did not work for me. Let's just keep going. Okay, parted accomplishes the same, but with a different interface. 
All right, let's try it with parted now. Uh, oh, we we don't have we don't need to use sudo. Uh, so cancel. Okay, so that didn't work either. Um, we don't have uh, the same environment they have here, so we don't have that invite device. But we'll just keep moving on. In the end, you quit with the Q key for programmatic creation of partitions on the command line without any interactive prompts. You accomplish the same result with a couple of commands. Okay, so let's follow this. We're in a VM, so it doesn't matter if things go awry. All right, and we don't have that uh, directory. That's not going to work. Yeah. So I'll do the, the final one, too, just to get it under my fingers, even though it doesn't work. Just go through the motions. All right, next part is retrieving specific device information. Sometimes when, a specific, when specific information for a device is needed, Either LSBLK or BLKID are well suited. FDisk doesn't like the work without super user, like to work without super user permissions. Here FDisk lists the information about the slash dev slash SDA device. Okay, so I'm not sure if I have this device, but let's try to list information about it. Okay, so for me it worked, and it looks like I do have um, this device. I think it's it's the the virtual hard disk EFI system. All right, and you would need sudo if you didn't or if you weren't already logged in as root as I am here, or if you didn't have already have root privileges, you would need to. All right, so the next one is BLKID. It's a bit similar to in that it wants super user permissions as well. Unless if you don't already have them, and I already have them. LSBLK allows to, oh, so this is, this is an even new one. So let's try this one, LSBLK. There we go. LSBLK allows to get information without higher permissions and provides the same informational output regardless. Okay, so we can see um, our disk information here, perfect. So let's see, let's do an LSBLK on uh, dev SDA. There we go, and let's do it on uh, SDB as well, because it looks like we have information for that as well. Oh, you know what? These are these are my two drives in my in my uh, Dell Power Edge. I've got two drives in there right now. One's a half. Uh, oh, yeah. One's one's a like 800 gigabytes, and the other one's like 500. Yeah. So those are my two drives. This command, which uses the dash p flag for low-level device probing, is very thorough and should give you good enough information for a device. BLKID dash p SDA one. Yeah. Okay. LSBLK has some default properties to look for. This is not a block device. But it also allows you to set specific flags to request a particular property. LSBLK dash P dash O size dev me 
0 and p1 size equals y12 n. Okay, and I don't have that device, so I can't do, do this on it. To access a property in this way makes it easy to script and even consume from the Python side of things. And, and ain't that the truth? Because um, let's open up uh, a Python terminal here. So if I were to do uh, ls blk, uh, and, and because I've got this fancy terminal here, I can do example equals lxblk. Yeah, so now you can see I've got it. Um, I've got it saved uh, into a, a list. Uh, so it uh, so I can do for item in example print item. I can iterate through that list, and let's see. Say I only wanted to see the information about uh, uh, SDA. I can say if SDA in item. Uh, then we're going to print it. So now I, now I can filter it out, I can change it around, I can, you know, I can only show, I can make it so I only see the first column. Whatever you want to do, uh, you can do. And you can feed it into input for, other, for another script. Let's say you were writing a script to send an email to someone if, if the uh, disks were, if something happened to the disks. You can just continually feed this output into a, a function, and then if, if it meets a certain criteria, you send out an email, something like that. All right, the next section is network utilities. Network tooling keeps improving as more and more servers need to be interconnected. A lot of the utilities in this section cover useful one-liners like secure SSH tunneling but some others go into the details of testing network performance, such as using the Apache Bench tool. SSH tunneling. Have you ever tried to reach an HTTP service that runs on a remote server that is not accessible except via SSH? This situation occurs when the HTTP service is enabled but not needed publicly. The last time we saw this happen was when a production instance of RabbitMQ had the management plugin enabled, which starts an HTTP service on port 15672. The service isn't exposed and with good reason. There is no need to have it publicly available since it is rarely used. And besides, one can use SSH tunneling capabilities. This works by creating an SSH connection with the remote server and then forwarding the remote port 15672, in my case, to a local port on the originating machine. The remote machine has a custom SSH port, which complicates the command slightly. This is how it looks. Okay, so let's, let's just try this command. It's, it's clearly not gonna work. Um, because it's a different machine. I, I get what they're saying. I, I've done this before. Um, if you're working on like a developing a web app or something, um, but um, I thought the book was going to make the point that uh, web apps aren't necessary if you can just build command line tools but it doesn't seem to be making that point right now. I'm not sure what point it's making, actually. Bad owner or permissions. All right, well, I don't even have sudo. All right, so I'm not sure what happened there. There are three flags, three numbers, and two addresses. Let's dissect the command to make what is going on here much clearer. The dash L flag is the one that signals that we want forwarding enabled, 
and a local port 998 to bind to a remote port. Rabbit MQ's default of 15672. Next, the dash P flag indicates that the custom SSH port of the remote server is 2223, and then the username and address are specified. Okay, so username and address are specified. Here we go. Lastly, the dash N means that it shouldn't get us to a remote shell and do the forwarding. When executed correctly, the command will appear to hang, but it allows you to go into uh, localhost colon 9998 and see the login page for the remote rabbit MQ instance. A useful flag to know when when tunneling is uh, dash F colon. It will send the process into the background, which is helpful if this connection isn't temporary, leaving the terminal ready and clean to do more work. Okay, so unfortunately that didn't work for me. And uh, not only that, I couldn't, I couldn't pull up a browser on this anyway. This is just a command line. Um, so let's try it on like um, my local machine. So I've got a, a git bash terminal here, so let's try this command. Can't resolve the host name. Now let's see if I got the command right. So This is a shell, nine 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 eight local host six seven two. Yeah, that looks right. A D E Z A. Oh, it looks like I have rabbit M1 instead of MQ. I'm not sure if it'll make a difference though, because I thought that was a custom value. Yeah, it, it's not gonna work because it's a custom value. Prod one that rabbit MQ. Yeah, it, it's, I don't have, um, yeah, because they're, they're SSHing like into a machine. So like I'd have to, I'd have to like SSH into, like here, I could do this. So uh, I think I could do this. So let's try this. So we're going to SSH, yep. But instead of, instead of into, this machine, we're going to SSH into my actual machine. So I'll get my IP address from here through IP config. And um, yeah, I think it's this address. Bad permission. Well, okay, I think I'm gonna have to move on. I, I don't think this is gonna work. Or maybe this this is, this isn't gonna work either. Nah, it's not gonna work. Okay, but I, they're, they're logging into a machine named this. So I don't have that machine to log into. So I thought I could log into like a different machine, like my my laptop from my VM in, in my lab, but uh, that doesn't seem to be working. Um, so I could probably pin up another virtual machine and, and get this command to work with that. Um, but I think I'm just going to move on. This isn't ringing any bells for me anyway, so I'm just going to move on. All right, so next section is benchmarking HTTP with Apache Benchmark AB. 
We really love to hammer servers we work with to ensure they handle load correctly, especially before they get promoted to production. Sometimes we even try to trigger some odd race condition that may happen under heavy load. The Apache benchmark tool, AB in the command line, is one of those tiny tools that can get you going quickly with just a few flags. Let's see if I have that, I doubt I do. Oh, I do, I already have that one, cool. This command will create 100 requests at a time for a total of 10,000 requests to a local instance where Nginx is running. All right, let's try this. Okay, so HTTP colon, I don't think I have Nginx running though. Yeah, so I got connection refused on mine. This is pretty brutal to handle in a system, but this is a local server and the requests are just an HTTP GET. The detailed output from AB is very comprehensive and looks like this, trimmed for property. So I didn't get anything because connection was refused to my local host. I don't even think I have Nginx running on here or installed really. This type of information and how it is presented is tremendous. At a glance, you can quickly tell if a production server drops connections in the failed requests field and what the averages are. A GET request is used, but AB allows you to use other HTTP verbs such as POST and even do a HEAD request. You need to exercise caution with this type of tool because it can easily overload a server. Below are more realistic numbers from an HTTP service in production, trimmed for brevity. Okay. Okay, so here's some realistic numbers. You can see the name of the server software. Um, you can see a more realistic number, transfer requests per second. All right. Now the numbers look different. It hits a service with SSL enabled and AB lists what the protocols are. At 83 requests per second, we think it could do better, but this is an API server that produces JSON and it typically doesn't get much load at once, as was just generated. Next section is load testing with Molotov. The Molotov project is an interesting project geared towards load testing. Some of its features are similar to those of Apache Benchwork, but seeing but being a Python project, it provides a way to write scenarios with Python and the Asenko module. This is how the simplest this is the simplest example for Molotov, how the simplest example for Molotov looks. Okay, so we're gonna try that. Um, let's try the, let's see if we've got the asynco module. Okay, we don't have it, so let's see if we can install it. Ah, so. We can't uh, install it either, so let's see. Oh, it's a it's a Python library. Okay, well let's let's follow along with the example. The example doesn't have uh, async yet, so. We're going to uh, uh, be doing the example before we do anything else. Okay, so this is going to be, um, yeah, so let's do, uh, we'll make a new uh, directory. We'll say uh, Python for DevOps, 
And then we'll make a virtual environment. Let's say Python 3. Or um, Python dash M. Oh, you know what? We have, we've got Python 2 on here. Okay, well, we do have Python 3. What the heck? Return to none. You know what? I wonder if I can't do this because I'm in a VM. Like, I wonder if you can't make a virtual environment in a virtual environment. Let's see what Google has to say about that. Oh, okay. That's 3.6, I want 3.8. Yeah. Um. Okay, I, I don't know what's going on. Let me just try some of the... Looks like I gotta install it. Let's do it for um, 3.8 so 3.6. Yeah, and I would say it's it's worth going and um, installing installing it if you don't have it because then it's all. I mean, I guess I guess there's a case to be made if you're having a a VM just for a particular thing, but and it's not meant to be used for any other thing but your Python project, then you don't need a virtual environment for it. But it's um, I I would probably still recommend it. And then you can have like a requirements.txt file. It, it'll just work a lot better. Okay, so now we can install our Python module that we will need to follow along. Which is Molotov, pip, install, Molotov. Oh, I probably should have upgraded, but... Oh, it looks like we're getting it. Yeah, and then if you don't have uh, a virtual environment, Enabled, you probably won't get this really nice and pretty uh, status bar with, with all the bars because uh, that really nice output there depends on the virtual environment. So you, you will get output, but it, it'll be a lot uglier. Okay, so let's let's use uh, by. Um, well, actually, never mind. Let's just go on. Um, oh, okay. No, let's use by load test.py okay import Molotov. I've never seen async before, and I didn't know you could uh, 
I didn't know there were words you could include before, like depth and width. I thought those had to come first. So let's give it a try. So we're going to save the file as load.test.py, we already did that. Create a small Flask application that handles both post and get requests at, at its main URL and save it as small.py. So let's, before we do anything else, install Flask. Flask. Okay, and I need a, a quick break to refill my water, so I'll pause it and come right back. All right, I am back. Next step is making another file. It's called small.py. And I'm in Vi, so I've got to hit uh, I, lowercase i, to go into edit mode. Uh, so, sorry, to insert mode. So now that I'm in insert mode, I can do from last. I can type. Vi is something that um, a lot of people shy away from. And, and he, I shy away from it as well a lot of the times. Um, if I can't use arrow keys in Vi, I, I typically just use nano. That's where it draws the line. But I guess the most um, like searched for thing on uh, certain uh, technical help sites, technical support sites, is simply how to exit out of Vi. Like that's the number one uh, need for technical support is just exiting this program that I'm using here. And I get it, it's, I, I was there. <laughs> I've definitely been there. And I'm not even, even now I'm not, I'm far from an expert in it. But I can use it, uh, fairly, um, like I can, I can accomplish goals in it. It doesn't prevent me from doing stuff. Are they seriously using percents? God damn it. Is this book old or something? No, it said it was new. Okay, that, that kind of annoys me. Yeah, that's annoying that it's using percents. Okay, so the next step is going to be the start to the Flax application with uh, flask underscore app equals small.py. Okay, I think that worked. Uh, oh, no, I've got to do flask run after that. There we go, perfect. Okay, it's running. Okay, so, and then run the, uh, and then run Molotov with the load test file created previously. Okay, so I, I obviously can't do that if I, if I don't use the dash F. I think if I use dash F, oh, there's, there's no option. So, you know what I'm going to do is, uh, one thing I am comfortable doing is, is using screen. So I'm going to do apt get install screen. Okay. And then uh, it's basically like opening a new, a new window in, in Linux. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to open a new window. So now I'm in a screen. So now I can hit uh, enter to go into my new window. 
And now I can do uh, that command. I can do uh, flask app equals small.py flask run. Okay, and now I can do control A, D. And I, I can minimize that window basically and then switch over to this other window and just have that other window run in the background. Molotov dash V dash R. See, I don't know if this is going to work because Molotov. Oh, it's, it's working. Cool. That was pretty awesome. Okay, so, oh, it looks like I didn't have any failures. I got 100 OKs. 100 requests on a single worker ran against the local Flask instance. The tool really shines when the load testing is extended to do more per request. It has concepts similar to unit testing, such as setup, teardown, and even code that can react to certain events. Since the small Flask application can handle a post that redirects to a Google search, add another scenario to the load underscore test dot py underscore file. This time, change the weight so that 100% of the requests do a post. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go back into my other screen, so it's screen dash R to return to the other screen since it's the only screen running. Oh, and we can see all those 100 gig requests that we that we ran. Um, so let's just let's just keep the flash server running. So we'll do Control A D again to, to minimize that window and switch over to this one. Then we'll do a LS. We can see we've got uh, load underscore test. I'm not sure what this extra underscore is, but um, they want us to. Uh, to edit this file, so that's what we'll do. Um, so we're going to change, oops. Oh, and I can't use the arrow keys. Um, shoot. Uh, what if I do this? Okay, I don't. So uh, let's, now let's see if I can edit this in a, in a better editor here in bin. Oops, so that obviously didn't work. It seemed to have killed the... I'm, I'm not sure what happened there. Oh, it actually made it so that the machine stopped running. The virtual machine. So let's start it up again. Not sure what happened there. That sucks. Oh, and I need another quick break. I'll be back real soon. All right, I'm back. I, on startup, uh, it installs NetMiko for some reason, so it, it's doing that now. Um, but it is complete, so let's get back to the book. And uh, let's try running Vim again on that. Um, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, we got to switch into the folder, and we'll try Vim load test.py. Oh, okay, now, now it works. Um, so it's saying that the file is already opened. Um, that's what this means. So we can either uh, we can we can edit it even though it's already opened. Um, but let's uh, let's edit it anyway. Oh. Okay. So you know what? I'm I'm just gonna use Nano because this is this is not working. Nano is perfectly fine.
it's slower, but thinking is the bottleneck. So I gotta wait for this to start up again, and then I'm gonna use a different text editor. I tried uh, using regular old Vi, but uh, I don't have arrow keys. I tried using Vim, but it uh, it's crashing my uh, VM when I use Vim. Um, so next I'll try Nano. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and it's got highlighting and everything. The nano is good. Okay, so we're going to leave everything the same. Except uh, when we define RESP. Oh. Actually, no, we're just going to add another scenario. Um, scenario one, scenario post. Okay, so yeah, we're going to add another one. Okay, so now let's try try this. So run this new scenario for a single request to show the following. Oh, uh, and then the file name comes next. It's not found. Um, you know what? It's because my virtual environment isn't activated. Yeah, that's another reason to have that virtual environment activated. See, now I've got it because I've got it uh, pip installed in there. Oops, so something happened here. Oh, you know what? It's because if I do a screen r, uh, oh yeah, it's a dead screen. So let's remove the dead screens with screen that dash white. Okay, and then we'll do uh, screen dash r again, see if that shows up there again. Nope, so there's no more screens, so now we'll start a new one. Uh, hit enter to end. And then, oh, I don't think we can up arrow, but let's see if it's in our history. Nope. Um, okay, so we're going to have to backtrack to that. Uh, command and run that again. 
Yeah, so ask, yeah, so we gotta do this command again. Flask app equals small dot py, flask run, perfect. And now we can de minimize this, uh, control A and then D. Okay, and then uh, okay. Perfect. Aha, so now, oh, um, still didn't work here. So we got an index error. Tuple index out of range. Uh, and this happened in line 11 of our script. Uh, we see this history zero here. That zero was out of range. So resp dot history zero. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, well, shoot, let's switch over um, to the other screen and see. Uh, oh, no, we didn't get we didn't get any valid requests. Oh, we did get one post request, it looks like. OK. Should I do something? Did I do something wrong here? So here's where it had a problem. But it could have been the line before. Maybe my syntax is wrong. That's always a possibility. No, I'm closing it. Syntax looks good. Yeah, everything's spelled right. Hmm. Let's see if it matches what they wanted. Uh. Oh, here it is. Okay, well let's try let's try taking out this uh, index here because that's where it was having a problem. And then let's try uh, running that again. Okay, so we still got a problem here. Tuple object has no attribute status. Okay, so this this is a tuple object now. So it should work to, to just do that because now now we're saying the first in the tuple is what we want. Oh, okay, now it just magically worked. I don't know what happened there. Uh, let's look at our um, post requests. Oh, we've just got get requests now. I'm confused. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there, but it seems to be, um, seems like it worked. A single request with dash R1 was enough to make this fail. The assertion needs to be updated to check for a 302 instead of a 301. Once that status is updated, change the weight of the post scenario to 80 so that other requests with a git are sent to the flask application 
This is how the file looks in the end. Okay, so let's make those changes. Okay, I did not get a failure though. Yeah, I got a success, so. But let's make sure that the file matches. Okay, and which file is this even? Load, yeah. Here we go. Okay, so we are gonna have our scenario one still there. Uh, and that's, that we're, we're taking the number 100 out. Um, then we've got async with session.get. Yep, that's still all the same. It looks like they added an extra slash at the end. And then assert, uh, yep, so that's all the same. Uh, next one, they're changing this to 80. Okay, and then uh, that all looks the same. And then rest equals await session dot post. Uh, yep, they don't have a slash at the end there. Yep, all that looks the same. Redirect status, here's, wh here's where it gets tricky, but it looks like it uh, matches. Error, unexpected redirect, that's nice and easy. I wish they had used the uh, F in front of this and then the, the brackets. Um, but it looks like they're like reverting to their old style. Okay. And then uh, here's where we need to change it, I think, to be 302. Oh, that's interesting. I, I thought they wanted to change it to be 302. I thought that was the purpose. The assertion needs to be updated to check for a 302 instead of a 301. But I don't see where they're doing that. They they keep it as 301. See, they I thought they would need to change this to 302. Um, I mean, let's try to change it to 302. Why not? Okay, and then uh, run uh, load test.py for 10 seconds to distribute the requests. Two for a git and the rest with a post. Run this file. Uh, we've got to run it for 10 seconds, though. I'm not sure how to do that. Um, 10. Yeah, that didn't work. We're, we're getting an error here as well. So we got 10 failures. As you can see, Molotov is easily extendable with pure Python and can be modified to suit other more complex needs. These examples scratch the surface of what the tool can do. So this is another tool that really isn't uh, ringing a lot of bells for me. Um, and not only that, I'm, I seem to be having a lot of trouble getting it to work. Yeah, so, uh, okay, well, let's just move on. Next section is CPU t utilities. There are two important CPU utilities, top and each top. You can find the top pre-installed in most Linux distributions today. This is one I'm very familiar with and use whenever I have the need to, which is often, I would say. But if you are able to install packages, HTOP is fantastic to work with, and we prefer its customizable interface over top. Okay, so let's see if I've got HTOP. I don't, so let's install it. There are a few other tools out there that provide CPU visualization and perhaps even more monitoring but none are as complete and as widely available as both top and HTOP. For example, it is entirely possible to get CPU utilization from the PS command. Okay, so let's, let's try that. So PS-EO, CPU, ID, user, args, sort-r, Head ten. Uh, okay. 
All right. The PS command takes some custom fields. The first one is PCPU, which gives the um, CPU usage, followed by the process ID, the user, and finally the command. Um, that pipes into a sorted reverse because by default it goes from less CD, CPU usage to more and you need to have the most CPU usage at the top. Finally, since the command displays this information for every single process, it filters the top 10 results with the head command. Okay, so I, I don't have anything. It's all zero. I get maybe because it's a virtual CPU, either that or I'm just not doing anything yet. But I'm going to definitely uh, highlight this because I want to come back and be able to run this command. But the command is quite a mouthful. It is a challenge to remember. Well, <laughs> that's why I have a, as long as I can log into my Amazon cloud, I, I don't have to remember it. I just look at my book notes. And is not updated on the fly. Oh, well, there you go. That's not a good thing. <laughs> Even if aliased, you are better off with top or htop. As you will see, both have extensive features. So you know when you run it you get a snapshot of what the cpu was at the time you ran it but more useful is just a running snapshot of the cpu so you can see how it changes over time viewing processes with htop the htop tool is just like top an interactive process viewer but it is fully cross-platform works with osx freebsd openbsd and linux offers support for better visualizations, see figure 4-1, and is a pleasure to use. Visit uh, hisham.hm slash hshop for a screenshot of htop running on a server. One of the main caveats of htop is that all the shortcuts you may know about top are not compatible. So you will have to rewire your brain to understand and use them for HTOP. Well, that doesn't sound good. Yeah, the, you get a nice graph there. Yeah, this looks pretty nice. Right away, the look and feel of the information displayed in figure 4-1 is different. The CPU, memory, and swap are nicely shown at the top left and they move as the system changes. The arrow keys scroll up or down and even left to right, providing a view of the whole command of the process. Okay, so let's see the difference here. Just run each top. Ah, look at this, much better. And now we get um, more information. We get how it changes over time. Yeah, each top is, is much better. And we get we get uh, instructions down here. I wonder if I can just do a control C though. I can. Cool C. Okay. Want to kill a process? Move to it. Oh, that's nice. With the arrow keys, or hit uh, forward slash to. Ooh, so nice. Incrementally search, and filter the process, and then press K. Wow, that's cool. So let's um, open a, a new screen. We're gonna do screen. And we're going to run a, a process. We're going to run Python. OK, and then we're going to detach the screen. And then we'll run htop. And now we'll uh, search for our process we've got running by using a forward slash and typing in Python. And um, there we go. We've got uh, one process running, um, which is our flask that we had. Uh, we'll leave that one running. Um, so let's hit Enter again. Or, or let's, let's uh, search again for Python. Oh, it looks like it just finds the first search. It looks like there's another one down here, but we didn't find it. But we can see it's right there, so we'll, we'll hit K. And uh, then we'll hit uh, Enter. There we go, and now we killed uh, that process. So if I do a Control C, and I do a screen R uh, for uh, screen 26024, um, oops, uh, actually the other screen. Uh, 
two, six, one, three, two, we can see my uh, Python terminal has been terminated. Okay, and then I'll kill this window, control A, K, and then yes, there we go. A new menu will show all the signals that can be sent to the process. For example, sig term instead of sig kill. Ah, so you can more gracefully terminate it. It is possible, possible to tag more than one process to kill. Press the space bar to tag the selected process, highlighting it with a different color. Made a mistake and want to untag? Press the space bar again. This all feels very intuitive. One problem with HTOP is that it has lots of actions mapped to F keys and you may not have any. For example, F1 is for help. The alternative is to use the equivalent mappings when possible. To access the help menu, use the H key to access the setup. Use Shift S instead of F2. The T, again, how intuitive, enables, toggles the process list as a tree. Okay, so let's let's see that. H top T. Okay, so now we've got a tree, so we can see this process here is in another screen. It's tied to this other screen. That's really useful. And so this is our flask, because we're running our flask in another screen. That's really cool. Probably the most used um, functionality is sorting. Press uh, greater than sign, we'll press that. There we go, I, I, here we go. We can sort it by, let's sort it by the process ID. So, there we go. Oh, and my foot is really hurting for some reason. And a menu appears to select what type of sorting you want. PID, user memory, priority, and CPU usage are just a few. There are also shortcuts to sort directly, skips the menu selection by memory, shift I, CPU, shift P, and time, shift T. Finally, two incredible features. You can run strace or lsof directly in the selected process as long as these are installed and available to the user. So I, they might not be, so let's, let's try to run them uh, outside of this application. So we're going to do S trace, and we'll do LSOF. OK, we don't have either, so let's install both. I think I can just do it all. I can do two in one line like that. Yeah, so now I'm installing both packages. Where's my water? Oh, I think I left it in the other room. Um, I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. So now let's see if, if these work. So S trace. Uh, there we go. Yep, it works. And now it um, takes us to the help menu though because we didn't invoke it correctly. And then LSOF works as well. So let's open HTOP again and we'll type in S trace. Oops. Uh, okay, we'll type in. Okay, we'll get back to the main screen. Finally, two incredible features. You can run strace or lsof directly in the selected process as long as these are installed and available to the user. So let's select a process. We're going to select uh, the, this final process here. And then we'll do lsof. Um, actually, hopefully they'll give us instructions for how to do that. If the processes require super user permissions, HTOP will report that, and it will require sudo to run as a privileged user. To run strace on a selected process, use the S key. For LSOF, use the L key. Okay, so let's let's you use. Uh, oh, okay. Interesting. And let's use the L key. Ah, there we go. So it worked. S key, L key, and I'm using escape to get back out of it. If either S trace or LSOF is used, the search and filter options are available with the forward slash character. 
what an incredibly useful tool. Hopefully one day other non-F key mappings will be possible. Even though most work can be done with the alternative mappings. Tip, if HTOP is customized via its interactive session, the changes get persisted in a configuration file that is usually located at .config slash htop htoprc. If you define configurations there and later change them in the session, then the session will overwrite whatever was defined previously in the htop rc file. Cool, yeah, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm sold on htop. Um, so let's, um, let's do one more section here. Uh, you know what, let's stop here. We're gonna stop at uh, working with uh, uh, Bash and, and, and ZSH. I wanna move on to something else. So that's gonna be the end of, of this video. Um, yeah, HTOP is a big takeaway from this. Really much, much better way to monitor your system than, than TOP or something like that. Um, and you, with TOP, you can't kill a process, anything like that. So anything you wanna do with, with your system, I think you can even use it to check uh, which users are, are, are in your system. Um, it, so you can do a, a sort by. Yeah, so F6 is sort by. Um, oh, is that not working? How do I... What was the, um, well, I can hit F1, can't I? Oh, here we go. So isn't there a way to look at the users, to see user information? Uh, let's see, let's do F6. Oh, here we go, we can sort by user. Okay, so yeah, now you can see all the users that are logged into, not, well, not logged into your system, but that, that are running processes. So this is really good if you're on a, a jump host um, and you wanna see what your coworkers are doing, um, you can use this and, and see uh, exactly which uh, devices they're, they're logging into and who's logging into them. Um, I, I used to use, um, the command uh, who or 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 w h w for that, but I kind of wish I had known this command because it makes it a little easier. But I mean w and who is is, is pretty nice though. Like w is is fine, but you can get it looks like you can get more detailed information using h top that you can't get through w because w you see I have no results here, but h top if I sorted by user, you can see I've got a lot more detailed results about what is happening on the system. All right, so that's gonna be it for this video. Um, I'll see you in the next one where I uh, work with Bash and ZSH.